of the Jim Rouse Building of the Visionary Arts Museum. I have one of our teens, Kevin Tan, who got a great interview with, at the Youth Congress Conference. Check it out. Hi, Shante Campbell. Hi, this is Kevin Tan. Both of our teens are talking at the Visionary Arts Museum. We're here for the International Youth Foundation Congress. Our time is now, and we're here with Mr. Ashley. Right. Yeah. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Thanks I'm for coming. Good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So, tell us. Sure. How did everything go well. Sure. Everything went well. We had a youth congress in the afternoon. Yes. And we had invited about 60 young people from Baltimore City, young leaders from Baltimore City, New York, and Washington, D.C. And uh, also four guests who have been profiled in this book, what we're calling Our Time Is Now. Um, and it was a celebration, a recognition of young people taking action around the globe. No matter whether you're in, the, uh, in Baltimore City or in Buenos Aires in Argentina or in UK. So it is a celebration, an acknowledgement of young people taking action and being at the forefront of change. Yeah. You know, since I'm from Nepal, a country called Nepal, I'm working at the International Youth Foundation for the last four years. And uh, I started my activism actually at the age of nine. We had uh, uh, a king ruling the country, and my family has always been involved in politics, so it was kind of a, 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 a very normal thing for me to do, to go and you know to work for democracy in my country. And from 14 and 15, I started radio programs, national network, addressing urgent uh, youth issues in Nepal. I worked with members of parliament in addressing uh, youth needs in Nepal. Then I had the uh, uh, luck to come to this country and did my undergraduate and graduate degree and fortunately found the International Youth Foundation who works primarily in youth development in about 70 countries. So it's, it's good to when you can mix your passion with your career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, and this book is such a great reflection of all the great teens that are doing positive things uh, all around the world. And it was introduced by the Bishop Tutu. And it just has such an amazing touch of uh, stories of just teens all around the world um, doing positive things in the world. And there were some great speeches. I personally feel the uh, Youth Congress Conference has uh, been an extremely um, great example of what our teens um, need to be involved in as far as going out in the world and doing positive things and letting the message be known out there that the youth is uh, not useful um, but it is hopeful and they are our future um, and you youth need to grab a hold of the life by the horns and take this opportunity to really show everyone out there that you guys um, are living and are going to be living for a long time. And also to make everything even more spectacular is that you know the first uh, World Youth Congress conference was held here, right here in your hometown, which is Baltimore. So all you youth out there locally, worldwide, you guys have a great opportunity to really grab life by the horns and go for it. I first started my trip going to California, in Petaluma, where there are about 60 young people from the age of 15 to 29 belonging to families of wealth in the United States who got together in a retreat to talk about how to make this world a better place. Then I went to Mexico and worked with the University of Mexico to talk about how to support young social entrepreneurs in Mexico. Then I came back and went to Minnesota in a juvenile correctional facility and met young offenders who had committed crime in their lives but were very still hopeful about making it. They really wanted to succeed in life. Then we went to a peace jam in Minnesota bringing in together about 300 students from the schools in Minnesota who were talking about how to build peace in the world. And they went, we, then we went to Seattle in a lakeside school and heard about a new global citizenship program where they're trying to build a sense of citizenship among its students. And this evening, we came back this evening, this morning at 3 o'clock, and this evening is the culmination of what it is all about. It is a celebration of the spirit of young people. And 
It is a celebration of recognizing young people who have taken action in the communities. You know, I want to, I, before I introduce the young leaders who we have here today, I would like to share a story which I had. And this little girl, I never will forget in my life her name, Bukwe Luku, 15 years old girl, comes and sits next to me. And she asks me the first question, are you HIV positive? And I was pretty shocked. I never had that question in my life before, not on the first meeting. I said, I'm not, are you? And then she said, I'm not, but he is, he is, she is. She showed three young people in that team who are HIV positive. And you know, I believe that one of the biggest problems in HIV AIDS battle is the stigma. So I asked Buku, is it okay that you're playing with them? And she said, you know, my parents say it's not okay. My teachers say not it's okay. But she said, she's been my friend for the last six years. And she was raped at the age of nine. How, and she said, how could I not play with her? I love her. And she said, I have convinced all 17 of my friends to keep on playing with her. And I wrote down, because for me, she was Mother Teresa. She was Mahatma Gandhi. Because of pure compassion and love for another human being, she's fighting a battle as I talk today. So as organizations, as individuals, as citizens of this world, we should never, ever dare to allow these young people to be defeated in the battle that have raged against injustice, whether it's economic, political, social, or civic. So thank you once again for joining us to celebrate that spirit of young people that we have today. So what do you think of um, the America? What do they think about it? Yeah. You know, the United States is a great country. You should be lucky that you're living in this country. But at the same time, as every country has its own flaws, of course, this country has its own flaws too. Um, I, uh, I truly believe that uh, this country provides uh, people uh, to live their dreams, uh, to uh, grab the opportunity to be successful. Um, and, um, but at the same time, um, I think uh, one of the things which I've realized in this country is that uh, the, the systems is not allowing young people to be very active in the communities. Um, and I don't know what the reason is uh, yet so far, but you know, before I came here, I was in Minnesota and Seattle in high school talking to different uh, young people. Mm -hmm. And they were so inquisitive in, 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 in uh, volunteering and starting projects and everything. Uh, so they're finding ways to be involved in the communities. So I think systems need to be very uh, responsive to the demand that exists out there for young people to be uh, social entrepreneurs, you can be business entrepreneurs, or young people being just active in the communities. Um, so yeah, but but great country to live in. I've always respected. You know, uh, one of the one of, one of the things which I didn't find in my own country is that if I work in a restaurant, uh, people would look down upon me. Uh, but here you work. The work is valued a lot, which I absolutely appreciate. So. For young people in Baltimore City in the United States, you gotta just grab the opportunity this country has to give and, um, and just, you know, uh, build a good community and at the same time always try to question when something goes wrong. That's right. Yeah. There you go. Words to live by. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for coming. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, good luck. Thank you. Um, saving the best part of the show, we have um, just exquisite, extremely great, positive. Uh, young people uh, that gave a interview, uh, a speech at the Congress. Uh, check out this person's speech. Hello, my name is Jocelyn and I am from Canada. I'm from Ottawa, which is just north of New York. And the reason why my project was profiled in the book is because four years ago, and probably many of you in this room, I took a life-changing trip overseas, the first my bubble. My trip was to Kenya, and it was there that I realized that my bubble, where I can consume whatever I want and never think about it, is in fact not the reality all over the world. I realized that the coffee I drank was responsible for farmers working long hours getting paid on fair wages. I realized that the clothes I wore were made in sweatshops. I realized that my paper that I used was resulting in clear cuts. Every day, my bubble burst a little bit more. Until one day, Jessica, who I met in Kenya, who some of you in this room had the pleasure of meeting as well, decided that if we were going to actually do something, it had to begin with us. We started with small things. We started reusing the other side of the paper. We started
started buying fair trade coffee whenever we saw it. We both stopped eating meat. We started using less water. And for those of you who've done those small things in your life, I'm sure you know what I mean when I say that every time you do something, you become more empowered. We've become so excited about this concept, we've actually made it the action empowerment movement. So every time we took an action, we became more empowered. Every time we became more empowered, we took more action. Our classmates started to think we were going a little bit crazy. Because <laughs> every day, we would tell them what we were doing. And then one day, we had a new announcement. We decided that we weren't just going to change ourselves, that we were going to go back to Canada, and we were going to revolutionize our entire country. Yeah. Our first project was to bike across Canada, 5,500 miles. And we decided that while we were biking, we were going to visit as many schools as possible. We decided the best way to bring our message was in the form of a play. You might have thought that we had been in a play or had written a play, but of course neither of those are true. None of us had any experience in this matter. We wrote quite a good play, I think, about how one hour of your life can transform the entire world. One hour from getting up in the morning, getting dressed, packing your lunch, grabbing a cup of coffee, and getting in your car or your bus on the way to school or work. That first tour, I couldn't even explain to you what it felt like. We ended up having 30 people from around the world, people we had never met, people we had never even heard of that wanted to join our cause. We spoke to over 10,000 young people on that first tour. And of course, at the end, with our action empowerment loop still spinning, we decided that we couldn't end there. We were gonna learn how to incorporate, how to become a charitable organization, and how to take our movement even further. This is four years later. We've now done five cross-Canada tours. We've had 200 volunteers either on bike tours or on performing teams around Ontario. We have 12 full-time staff, we've now reached 45,000 young people. This dream is a little out of control. <laughs> I'd rather tell you about my challenges with things that I've learned. I want to talk to you a little bit about what these two weeks has meant to me. Like some of the people involved, the people that were on this tour, we had questions before about whether we could actually leave our work. We have lots of responsibilities, more than we want sometimes. But we all did decide to come on this tour. And I can't even describe to you how it has felt. I do presentations all the time. So when I looked at the agenda and realized we were doing lots of presentations, I didn't think I was going to learn that much. This is kind of what I do. But I didn't think about who I was going to be with. Like all the young people I'm traveling with, we have a lot of responsibilities. People expect a lot from us. Often when we go to funders or when we ask people for support, we have to pretend that we know what we're doing. It's not very often that we're allowed to say we've never done this before, and in fact, we're probably going to make tons of mistakes and skip an entire failure. <laughs> we're told not to say those things. And on this tour, it was okay to say those things. At 2 o'clock in the morning, while we're lying in bed and can't sleep, it's okay to say the hard times we've had. It's okay to say how hard it was to fire somebody for the first time. All these things we've never been able to do before. I keep on saying that this tour for me has been therapy. Therapy that I can't experience anywhere else. And therapy that I think is unique to the International Youth Foundation and to Youth Action Net. There's something about this organization that fosters a safe space. Something that makes us feel that we're not competing with each other, but with, that we can actually work together for a common goal. All of us have different projects, but we are all allies. And I want to thank you guys for bringing this together and for providing this experience with us, which I'm sure will never be matched again. Thank you. Now there's a powerful message uh, from a powerful young person. If you're going to walk the walk and, and talk the talk, um, and that could be very well be with any any young person, any person. Um, and as you see, she was saying that she has a book out called From Junk to Funk. I mean, and that's basically walking the walk and talking the talk. See, this is not just a local thing. This is a worldwide, international thing. Teens are. Uh, realizing that it doesn't matter what the color, religion, what your background is, you're a teen, you're a young person, the future is in your hands, make it bright. Now, let's check out this last young person. Thank you everyone, uh, my name is Marjan Hill, and I am originally, I was born and raised in India, and I moved to the U.S. at the age of 15 to San Jose where I went to high school, and recently moved to Washington, D.C. My doctorate in anthropology, and the reason I'm actually this book is when I was 16 years old in high school, I came out of the closet as gay in high school and dealt with a lot of homophobia. And um, you know, like every day, 
it became more and more prevalent and started realizing that something had to change, something had to dig, because I got to a point where I could not go to school anymore and, and you know, deal with the fact that, um, deal with the, sort of the homophobia that came from uh, coming out or being the home, sort of, what I think only people on my campus to come out. Um, and what I did was I sort of took a step towards changing the situation, which started very, very well. I actually started my first gay straight alliance on campus, um, which did quite really, really well in terms of creating people, changing people's mindsets and creating the kind of change that was needed, and especially bringing up issues of uh, marginalization that a lot of young gay and lesbian people face today. And there was this time in high school and this is when I've been here, I was fairly successful in getting the vacation months up and running. There was a time in high school when um, I woke up one day, went to school, and um, I heard the news that Matthew Shepard had been murdered, and um, it was really tragic, I was really sad about it. And I went to all, I went to my classes as usual, and um, two, or th or two or three of my professors, or my teachers at that time, pulled me aside, and they, they told me, they pulled me aside and they told me that they were really concerned about my safety. And they, they wanted me to not be so outspoken and and not be so vocal about my sexual identity, about the type of activism that I was doing at my high school. And even though I was you know, very appreciative of the fact that they were very concerned about my safety, it was at that moment that I realized that the silencing of those queer people's voices, the one person who was advocating for gay and lesbian rights, instead of talking to the rest of the class about homophobia, about hate crimes that are committed against gay and lesbian people, in that silencing of that is where homophobia comes from, in that silence. It doesn't come from, it doesn't appear from, you know, people calling each other names. It comes from the silencing of the, the gay and lesbian voices. And from there on, from that day on, I was committed that I wanted to make my voice as a gay person heard and the voices of other gay people heard. And as I moved on to college, I discovered that media or filmmaking was a wonderful tool for to accomplish what I wanted to do. And I started out with a $200 in my pocket and a, a small film and very, you know, frustrated and angry and sort of loads of me screaming about uh, having gone through this whole experience in high school and wanting to just get it out and get it out of me and wanted to create something you know, productive out of it. I made a film called Everything. It was an eight minute film. And the film basically follows, it's a silent film, but there's only music and, you, and it, there's no words in it. And the film basically follows, it's sort of, sort of like a, an autobiographical film, but follows the life of this young Indian gay guy who, and it's, goes through the sort of the, the issues that uh, in what it's a day in the life of a young Indian gay guy and the different issues that he faces throughout the day, starting from homophobia in high school to relationships to um, marginalization because of his religion and, and ending at wanting to commit suicide. And since then, the film has played at uh, like six different countries all around the world and it has, um, is actually in the process of being um, screened in all over the UK at the moment. It played in Canada, it played in India, it played all over the US. It was one of the, the most successful films I've made um, in my career as a filmmaker so far. My last film project was, you know, sort of to give a comparison, my last film project was about $100,000. And, um, but I still tell people that that two hundred dollar film that I made with a handheld camera, with no resources, with no way to support me in what I was doing, is still spoke to people who had seen the film in a way that you know no none of my other you know or it, it just had this meaning behind it, and it was at that moment that I realized how much power media holds in informing our society and changing people's mindsets and. I don't wake up in the morning and I don't make a film with the intentions of changing the world. I've never thought about, you know, oh, today I'm going to make a film that's going to change the world. What I hope is that my films will affect people on a sort of a micro level. It will, you know, it will create these disturbances, these intellectual disturbances on a very micro level so that when they go home that night, they will think about 
what it's like to be gay or what are the, uh, the issues related to being gay. And it's from there, it's from that sort of intervention, on that micro level intervention, that you start changing people's minds. Set. And from there is where social change occurs. And, um, and that's what I did, and that's what I've been doing since then, and have been very successful, and I'm very thankful to IYF for having supported my work over the past three years, and um, yeah. <laughs> that's a young, might I put emphasis on young, filmmaker. Already has a film out there, he's a fil filmmaker. Steven Spielberg, Spil <laughs> filmmaker. Uh, that, that could be you. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. It's very, very great. And as I promised you, I would show you a young filmmaker uh, in the making, um, and is making uh, of the future. Um, make it, make it out of something, make it bright, make it positive. You saw four teens who did that, who made it positive, and are still continuing to make it positive by having you all teens to join on as well. Um, to to do positive in the world. There is good that can be done in the world and it can be done by you. Um, so get out there, get out there, get up, and do something and you know don't let your lives you know turn into nothing. So uh, stop fronting and get out there.